Now, there's a fight in the Democratic Party. There's a faction of the Democratic Party that we're working with that are introducing, that, that want Glass-Steagall. And we're working with this faction. And some of them were active with Bernie Sanders, and they formed this thing called Our Revolution. And, and we've been working with them, going into Congress and the state legislatures with both Glass-Steagall resolutions and our four laws. So this faction of the Democratic Party is hoping to, to get Trump to go with Glass-Steagall. So that's one, th one aspect. And there's a huge fight in the Democratic Party. Obama is trying to control the Democratic Party and trying to control who is going to be the leadership of the Democratic Party so that they can set, so that they have control over the Democratic Party and not have a pro glass steagall grouping or a more Bernie Sanders type grouping or a, a grouping that's close to us. Like in Washington State, we have two state legislators we're working with who have introduced LaRouche's four laws into the state legislature for memorial to the Congress and to Trump. Uh, Bob Hesagawa from Renton and Marilyn Chase from Shoreline. Uh, these are people that have been in touch with us for a decade talking to us about this. And, they're, and so this is going on all over the United States. So there's a fight. And, uh, and then you have the McCain and, and, and Lindsey Graham types you know, going absolutely nuts. And they're trying to put a, a, a bill in the Senate that prevents Trump from being able to remove the sanctions on Russia. So they're, so they're running that operation. And if he does, they will impeach him. If he does, he's going to impeach him. Right, exactly. So, <coughs> so what, what's Sanders doing? I mean, I thought he had right. such a Trump article back. Is he just now? <laughs> no, 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 he's not. Sanders was being interviewed, and then, it, and then the thing went off. But he was, he was, he was going after Trump for being caught for, for on, on, on supporting Putin, and he, he was doing the whole Putin routine. He's endorsed. Uh, 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 he's endorsed Hillary Clinton. Oh, yeah, yeah, but he's he's okay. He's, he's uh. He's behind the bomb. Well, I have my own view of 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 uh, Bernie Sanders. Okay. There's a word for it. It's called impotence. Mm -hmm. Impotence. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and he made that very clear in his campaign, that he would not go, he would not take it on. He said the right things, but he wouldn't take it on. And the thing that I saw, this few minute clip I saw him <coughs> saying that, a president can't do anything. Yeah. It's control. You, only if you support me doing something, can we do something? Okay, in other words, it's up to you, the people. It's not up to me. That's called impotence. It's up to me, the president, to tell it, to organize the people to support something. It's not me going to you and saying, it's up to you, what do you want? That's not leadership. That's impotence, and and that's where I I I uh, <laughs> I, I part with 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 uh, Bernie Sanders. And no, I'm not I'm not saying who he's connected to. I'm not getting into any other thing than what I saw him. He had a chance to step out during the uh, the nomination yes. and lead his party, yes. and he failed. Yeah, he was done as a politician. Right. Exactly. Yeah, we got a younger version of him here. <laughs> <laughs> And so you've got a lot, of, a lot of weird things going on in the media. Like they had the big push to, that they're going to make Elliot Abrams uh, the Undersecretary of State. And they said that, that that's who uh, Tillerman, uh, Timerson, Tillerman, Tillerman? Tillerman. 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 Tillerson. 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 I got it all wrong. Tillerson said that he wanted Abrams. And Trump said no. Now, you know who Abrams is? Elliot Abrams. People know who Elliot Abrams is? No. He's a neocon. He's a psychotic neocon. He's like, uh, you know, he's sort of like, what's his name? The other guy, the other psychotic neocon that they, that they were going to make. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bolton. He's not as rabid appearing, but he, he's behind, he's like super psychotic. Now, how many neocons has Trump appointed 
to positions of cabinet level or secondary level in the U.S. government. How many neocons? Identified neocons. Did anybody know any? I don't know of any neocons. Maybe the, the CIA director? I don't know. So you got to ask yourself, where are the neocons and the neoconservatives? Uh, uh, go to war, uh, project for a new American century. Where are they? They're not in the Trump administration. But they're all globalists, so uh, Trump is not. So it's yeah, but I mean, where are they? Well, you know, you're, you're a Republican, right? You're supposed yeah. to appoint these people. Where are they? They're not there. And who does he appoint? Mattis, who went to Bush before the Iraq war and told him this was a terrible thing to do. Flynn, who blew the whistle on U.S. support for al-Qaeda and, 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 and ISIS. He's a national security boss. And they're trying to go after him because yes. he supposedly had it, was talking about uh, getting rid of the sanctions to Russia before, before Trump's inauguration. So he's being blasted out of the media, right? So, so now let's, let's talk about impeachment. <clears throat> impeachment is a very easy thing to do. Convicting the president on the charges of impeachment in the Senate is a very hard thing to do. Impeaching a president only takes a majority of the House of Representatives. Convicting him of the charges of impeachment in the Senate requires a two-thirds vote in the Senate. Yeah. It's an extraordinary vote. Yeah. It's an extraordinary No yeah. president has ever had its impeachment sustained in the Senate. So impeachment is not really easy to do. Usually they get the guy to resign first. That's what happened too. Yeah. Or they take him out in a wooden box. Okay, either way. Either way. Okay. One other way. One other way. So, 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 so this is, so now, so now we come to the question of the discussion that Ridley. Trump is going to have with Pierre, uh, Pierre son, <laughs> Justin, <laughs> Pierre son, Justice, just, Justin Trudeau, and I think there's, I think the Canadians at, uh, elite are like really in shell shock since the election because Trump said he's going to. Ditch now. Right up, yeah. <clears throat> now, I regret to tell you that I have not, I regret to tell you that I have not studied what is in NAFTA, how it works, all of the details, who gets what, how does it work, how does it work. But I know that back in when it was being put forward, I was campaigning hard against it back in the early 90s when it was being put forward. I was campaigning very hard against it. Now, um, so the economies of the United States, Mexico, and Canada are completely connected in with this thing. And there's a lot of conflict, especially between Canada and the United States, over interpretations of the rules and judicial actions with respect to the rules. Now, how is Trump going to eliminate NAFTA? And then the question is, does he need to eliminate NAFTA? And then the third question is, what is he going to replace NAFTA with? Now, uh, so let us look at Mexico, the United States, and Canada prior to NAFTA. Okay. Basically, Mexico was food self-sufficient for the most part prior to NAFTA. Mexicans had a large population living in small, what are called ejidos. These are land, small plots of land that were the product of the Mexican Revolution, the right to have an ejido instead of living on a hacienda. So, so, the, so a lot of the Mexicans were rural, and they were uh, small farmers on these small plots. And, and uh, the government had a subsidy program so that all Mexicans would have, no matter how poor, would have, be able to afford 
uh, enough beans and enough rice, uh, uh, tortillas, tortillas yeah. or flour, to, which uh, to to survive. On. That was the Mexican government policy. So the tortillas were like cheap, and the, and the beans were cheap, and any anyone could afford it. And if you didn't have anything else to eat, you could always eat beans and tortillas. That was Mexico. It's enough. Okay, now. Uh, so what happened to Mexico? Free trade. NAFTA. Well, their, their, their internal agriculture production was not competitive with, and so they lost a lot of, you know, these farms got wiped out, and the people were, came to the United States, came to Canada to work. Because they didn't have any place to work, because they, there was no, they weren't being absorbed by the increase of the industrialization of Mexico. Mexico was not being industrialized, so if they, you're not going to absorb the people you're throwing off the land into the industrial development of Mexico, then where are, you gonna, where are they going to go? Well, you know where they went. You know where a lot of them went. And you know where they, they come and go. I know. Are you aware how the, Egypt, the Civil War or the Revolution in Chiapas started? No. Same, same thing exactly. The Orogan kicked off the small little plots of land. Yeah. And so most of them would make small things and go into the tourist areas and try to sell them. The tourist owners and the government said, well, we can't have all these peasants coming into tourist areas, first world tourist areas, and bothering first world people. They would start to herd them and kick them out of the towns, and they weren't allowed to sell their things. They weren't oh, wow. allowed to do any of that. So this is all yeah. this is all part of this whole process, okay? Yeah. So, so now you have cheap labor replacing other labor. You have economic refugee becomes now, and then you have the maquiladoras, which are the, the plants on the border. But what are they doing? Are they building Mexico with these things? No. What are they doing? They're exporting to the United States. Yeah. And what's happening to the United States is pop, its workers are losing their jobs. So that's what happened to the Mexico and what happened to the United States. Did the United States develop because of NAFTA? Did it help Mex the United States become more developed as a nation? No. And what about Canada? No. Did it help Canada become more developed as a no. nation? No. Did it? No. no it they lost a lot. Okay. So Canada, what, what happened to Canada? Well, they became... Oil, timber, resource, gas, rain, years of water. Yeah. Years of water, so, wood, draws of water. And, the, and, the, and, the, and so did, did, was Canada more of a manufacturing country prior to NAFTA? Yes. Okay, I don't know. Way I'm not sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what's happening here? So why, okay, does NAFTA need to be maintained because Everything is created such that it has everybody's connected in, and it, it, you can't just get out of it just like that. But what are you going to replace it with? That's a good question. By that old That's right. <laughs> like it was before. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe we see you. But what's 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 the discussion with Trudeau's going to be like? Well, the, he was asked to bring up uh, human rights. There goes that relationship. <laughs> there goes that. There goes that relationship. There goes that relationship. There goes that relationship. Do some research, find out what happens. In Excellent bring idea. Bring back a report. Right. Yeah, bring a report. The, uh, on the Put together a report. Yes. I, I would really, that would be I think be really that would great. be an excellent idea. Yeah. yeah, I think that's an excellent idea. Because it's going to be absolutely uh, <laughs> amazing if they have After to. Monday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one it's going to be wild after Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so, Obviously, he's going to try and change uh, <clears throat> Trump's mind about Putin. He already sent his ministers there. So the, the key Achilles heel that I see in the Trump operation is the Treasury. 
Um, this guy, Steven Mnuchin, yeah. is, yeah. is a, a problem. No because you're going to have to deal with the financial situation. And you can't do it without LaRouche's four laws and without Class D. And that is becoming increasingly understood by a minority of people in, uh, in the Democratic Party, some in the Republican Party, and others. It's becoming increasingly clear. Now, when you look at what the, how the Chinese finance things, it's, 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 it's pretty much in a Hamiltonian sort of way. They, they create the credit, and then they finance it, and then, you know. Well, they have their own central bank. They have their own central bank. Like yeah, 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 they did. So, they use a national bank system. But, and China has many national banks. It's not just one. It's, it's, they have this national bank that does this, and this national bank that does that, and that, and that. All their banks are really national banks. It's not, it's not, a, it's not that way. And the same thing goes with Japan. That same thing potentially can go with Japan. Japan has never let go of a state run financial system, except to the degree that they bailed out the international banks, but they never really let go of that, of that system completely. And Russia is returning to that system, although they don't really have it. Uh, they, they, they kind of got messed up there on that um, period of transition. Well, they still have a central bank. They have a central bank, but it's not, it's not, it's not. It's but not. it's still, it's still controlled by somewhat yeah. by the Rothschilds yeah. and the other. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. still is. Yeah, yeah. Still that's is the problem. Yeah. 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 So, so anyhow, so, so, so this is going to be a very, that's going to be a very key aspect of, of, of concern. Because that could blow everything up. You could have chaos. And you could have um, a financial system go under and have chaos. So, so that's uh, one of the aspects of concern. However, these bilateral relationships, to the degree that they develop, are, could be very effective in helping uh, provide uh, 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 at least, at least a, a model for what to do in a crisis. So I'm hoping that that's, that's the way it goes. Uh, can you explain the Venusian guy a little bit too? Um, well, this guy worked for Goldman Sachs. And then he went to work for George Soros. Oh, did he? Oh. For 15 years. He was a partner with Soros. Yeah and ran a bunch of major funds for him. And, and then he got involved in Hollywood and was the producer, his, his fund was the producer of Avatar and a whole bunch of movies which were very successful and made a lot of money. And then he went on to become a very big supporter of Hillary Clinton and the, and the Democrats, financed all the Democrats, and then somehow he ended up with Trump, Trump being his campaign finance manager. He was introduced to Trump and he was brought in as a campaign finance manager. So I'm not privy to the internal situation on that. I don't know, but we don't think this guy, and he lied before the, the, in, the, in the Senate, his House confirmation hearings, he lied. And he's lied a number of times about a number of things. So he's already showing that he doesn't tell the truth. So. You know, exposed him, exposed himself for not telling the truth, and then, uh, and then he was Mr. Foreclosure King. He's known as the Foreclosure King. Uh, Trump and company bought up IndyMac, which was the bankrupt foreclosure machine, and then uh, they turned it into uh, One West, and then they made a profit on it, and really at the government expense and massive foreclosure. So, so there is a certain brutal. Uh, how was it wrong? How did he lie? Um, he, he lied about a Federal Reserve report saying that Glass-Steagall would collapse the bond market. That's right. He, directly he lied said that. about that. And I believe he lied about some of the things that he did. But I don't know what the specifics of them, but he lied about some of the things that he did in terms of the um, foreclosure business. And he lied about the robo-signing, which is where they don't, they just have a, a robot signing the contracts for you, I think. I'm not sure. Did anybody know what robo-signing is on mortgages? Yeah, essentially there's no, yeah, huh? yeah. there's no verified, you know, due process of a Right, right. Yeah. It's just robo-signing yeah. on these mortgages. 
So he's, he's been accused of robo-signing and, and, and he lied about that. And, and it turns out he did, he did have a lot of robo-signing going on. So, so these are things that are, that are going on. So I'm going to stop there and open it up for discussion, questions, whatever people want to do. Sure. <laughs> How does any of this relate to Agenda 21? Is that something that's still ongoing in the world? <coughs> like, certainly Vancouver is an example of that, right? With all the high rises and all the rapid transit. Okay. The Agenda 21 led by Maurice Strong back in 1991 in Rio. Um, this was a promotion of a kind of development which actually prevented development. And uh, essentially, um, essentially uh, prevented development. The, the ideal development of an urban city is that you have Quarters. the core is civics, opera house, museums, library, and, and administrative. Then comes the neighborhoods, then comes the industrial areas as you go out, and then you have, you know, the farmland and the recreational areas. That's your ideal uh, development of a city. And the ideal city in the modern future will be a huge fusion plant or a nuclear power plant below, providing the energy for the city, and, uh, and then you build the infrastructure on top of that. that that's your future you know, efficiency. And your workplace is within walking distance or a short distance from where you live. And then you have these recreational areas outside of the city that you go to, you know, uh, parks, uh, parks on the inside, but you have all these areas. And then eventually you'll be growing food in, in buildings, aeroponics. You know, you have a whole, but all, but but th their view of a city is, uh, of city planning is to is to restrict development. Basically, it's basically to restrict development. So the cities can't develop. And uh, and the idea is to to use this as a insurgency against that, against development. Basically, an insurgency under the idea of city planning and and all of this. And um, so it's also anti-population increase. You know, uh, types of things. People, people probably know more about. Yeah, I spent. A, I haven't refreshed my mind on all of this stuff. I haven't been thinking about Agenda 21, but it's been part of the. That's part of the package. There's a lot of things like that. That are you know like. Oh, you want to build? You want to build a. A railway between. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna turn it into a, a, a nature preserve, or we're gonna turn it into this, or a historic this. You know, the block. You know, all of this has been going on. Oh, you you want to develop a mine? Well, sorry, we're gonna we're gonna do this. We're gonna put this regulation in. We're gonna put that it's regulation. It's a green agenda, right? Ah, so essentially, Trump has decided to undo all of that publicly. He said that we're gonna undo all of that, and he appointed uh, an Oklahoma, I believe, Attorney General or whoever he was to head up the EPA. He's gonna dismantle all of all of that stuff. Is He's saying he's going to dismantle all of it. Trump is saying he's going to dismantle all of it. I don't know how he's going to do that. I don't know all the details. But he's saying that he's going to dismantle all of it. So that things can get, get done. Things can be, can be done. So. Anyways, this may sound. Um, I haven't really looked into all of these things. Can you speak a little louder? Okay, I, have, I haven't looked into um, these things <clears throat> much that you but uh, a lot of this resonates with me. However, um, like the tar sands in Canada and uh, the oil, like perhaps for a time that needs to be maintained, but there's, you know, apparently much uh, more advanced and cleaner uh, energies out there that have been quashed for... Yeah, you, know, you transition out of that, yeah. Since the early, whenever, you know, a 19 or 20s from Nikola Tesla. Well, yeah, we have somebody here who, who's an expert in, in that area. Um, it, uh, we're, we're, so, we're talking nuclear now. 
nuclear fission, uh, fourth generation nuclear uh, fusion, uh, fission plants, and then sometime much further in the future, uh, fusion power. And what you'll be able to do with that is you'll be able to, to convert your uh, combustible um, energy sources to hydrogen, hydrogen fuel. From, uh, from, the, uh, from the energy dense desalinization of, of, of water, seawater especially. So you desalinate, not desalinate, you, you, uh, so you separate out, you separate, it out okay. separate out hydrogen from water to create your fuel. That's your future. And, and the Chinese are, are committed to that, and I'm hoping that, to get the U.S. committed to that also, and Canada. All right. Well, uh, you put down the figure 1970 as the point where the economic development of the United States went downwards. Right. This was also the time frame when the uh, uh, financial system was exactly. going into speculation. Would you say there's a, a relationship between the two? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, this is where we get into the four laws of LaRouche, but also the, the three principles in Hamilton's report on the subject of manufacturers. And uh, very quickly, uh, I'll quickly go through this, people, especially for people that haven't been here. Uh, <clears throat> the first principle is financial stability. The second principle is um, productive capital. And the third principle is increase in manufacturing, which, which increases the power of labor. Now, believe it or not, this was all put forward very rigorously, very understandably, by Alexander Hamilton in 1790 to 1791 in his four reports. And I, I should have brought some book, the books up. You can get the book. You can read it to, today, the four reports. And he became, and he became after he wrote these for the Congress, he became the Treasury Secretary and he tried to implement. Now, financial stability. At the time they wrote the report, a lion's share of debt was tied up in, in what were called uh, continental bonds. These were bonds issued to finance the Revolutionary War. These were foreign bonds, the foreigners held it, domestic people held it, states held it. So, and then the states themselves, the colonies themselves went into debt to finance the war. So we put all that debt together, and all this debt was, was an enormous sum at the time. It was, it was $73 million. Okay? And people were holding these paper, this paper. And it wasn't, people were holding it, it wasn't worth anything, and it was fluctuating in value. And what he said is that there is no financial stability in the country. If you want to do anything, you have to use silver or gold. But that, beyond that, you don't have financial uh, productive, you, you, can't, you can't use paper uh, currency. And that all, a lot of the gold and silver was tied up in speculating on the, on the, uh, on the, on, on the Continentals. So he converted the Continentals into, into U.S. Treasury debt. Not redeemable, not to redeem them, but to convert them into Treasury debt that provided a 4, 5, 6 percent interest to the people who held it. And that created the financial stability so that people would no longer have recourse to gold and silver, so they could put their gold in a in a bank, and then the bank could issue paper or credit based on that gold in, mul in, in, in multiplier of that for, 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 for use. 
So that's financial stability is required. Now, if you don't have a currency that's stable, you don't have financial stability. So what they now? So when when Franklin Delano Roosevelt came uh, after the war, he set up the Bretton Woods system. It was not cages. The Bretton Woods system was a fixed exchange system. The whole idea was if you had fixed exchanges between countries, using gold as a reference, then you would stop the speculation on the currencies and you would essentially create the financial stability so productive investment could proceed without having to deal with, this, with, the, with the fluctuations of currencies. Just like in the, uh, the uh, period prior to, to uh, Hamilton, you had this problem uh, with, with, with no, no credit. You had no credit. You couldn't get things done because you couldn't create credit to, pr to get people to do to that, that, or to create debt that would actually be productive. So the second thing that he did, he discussed, and the second, <coughs> the second uh, report was productive capital. He distinguished between capital which is not productive, which is not involved in being used for productive purposes, and capital which is. He distinguished between the two. And it's not how much money you have out there. It's how much, what is the money doing? In other words, a hundred dollars that's sitting in your mattress is different from a hundred dollars being used as a revolving loan in, in a productive activity in the, in, 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 in the system. A hundred dollars being used for speculation is very different from a hundred dollars being used. A hundred dollars in, uh, in uh, uh, you know, being spent on... Uh, Drugs is uh, very different from $100 being spent. What happened? Now that concept does not exist in modern, in modern, in the modern educational system of economics. This concept of productive capital does not exist in the university. You cannot have a discussion and tell somebody with a M MB, uh, uh, a master's in economics that there is a difference. They, they will tell you money is money. They will not tell you otherwise. And then lastly, the development of manufacturers. Uh, increases the division of labor, which increases the uh, the productivity and the introduction of new technologies and so forth. And so this is the, so the, the development of manufacturers. And from his standpoint, you had all these people on the land, and he said if you develop manufacturers, you can produce things that could improve the production on the land, and then people would be free to go into manufacturing and not be on the land, and the total product would be far greater in the society. And also the differences of personalities, the differences of, of, of potentials. And you'd actually have, people's potentials would be developed in different areas. And you could actually have a, an increasing division of labor. This, is, this was his idea. And he was up against Jefferson, who disagreed with him. He was up against the French physiocrats who disagreed with him, and said, no, if you invest in the manufacturing, you're taking, you're taking wealth away from the land. You, you're, you're using up wealth from the land. All wealth has to come from the land. And, and if you're developing manufacturing, you're actually taking it away from the land. It's actually a form of parasitizing the production of the land. And he said, no, you're taking the product of the land, you're transforming the manufacturing, and the manufacturing will allow you to increase the transportation infrastructure, allow you to increase the productivity of the land, and, and that, that was his concept of, uh, of uh, and so all of these three concepts are embedded in the original uh, reports to Congress that were written as he was becoming Treasury Secretary. And it is not, they do not discuss this. We had to revive it. We didn't know about it. We had to revive it starting in the late, in, in, in the late 70s. We started to discover, we discovered this only in the late 70s. We didn't know this was, that Hamilton existed. And Karl Marx never referred to Hamilton. Karl Marx never discussed Hamilton. He discussed Adam Smith, he discussed Ricardo, he discussed all these other guys, but he never discussed, he never talked about Hamilton. Not once, as far as I know. Why was that? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have a question. Yeah. Um, 
I just heard it on the news when I was coming up here. I don't know if you've already heard it on the news that there are Syrian families that are coming across the border in Quebec, Manitoba, and BC. Who? Syrian. Uh, are they coming for a while now? Oh, have they? Yeah. I They've been remember. coming to Manitoba. They say it's increased by 10%. It's it's, just they're coming up. for quite a while, and uh, the response of Canadian government was <clears throat> we will watch and see how the community holds. Yeah. yeah. That's it. They, so they're they don't feel safe. But, but they they're, putting, sense. they're putting it on the community. They, they haven't said, okay, we're going to send you some financial help or mm -hmm. anything like that. Mm -hmm. We'll watch and see how the community is going to deal with it. Yeah. But, oh, they've been coming for a while now. Okay. Yeah. okay. Did, did what I, I say make any sense here? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I have a question about the, uh, in today's world, economic world. I don't know if you're familiar with the term precarious. Maybe you'll be precarious employment. Maybe that first yeah. It came from this professor in England, Guy Stanford. He's been studying this for many years. He was here in Vancouver last year talking about it. Um, technological uh, advances have created a situation where we now have uh, a huge labor force but a small job force. <laughs> so now there, there, there are too many people looking for too few jobs. Okay, this, this is the future because of technology. No, you know, it's our, not. Our production has okay. increased enormously because of Okay, that, 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 that's a good question, but, but no, it's the opposite. Yeah, but it isn't. Because that I know, is I know, <laughs> I know, but it's the opposite. <laughs> but reality shows... <laughs> no, the reality is that the technology is not being used to really develop the productive yeah. power. The reality is the technology is only being used to make the existing uh, system more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Like, instead of building a new road, we have an app on our, on our phone that tells us the, the, yeah. the, quickest, yeah. the quickest way to get well, there. Well, the technology yeah. is actually being restricted. Exactly. It's not been to grow. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you there. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. That's where the future goes. Okay. I think uh, the good example uh, uh, is what is happening right now in Russia, in Far East. Like we have, uh, there is a lot of fish in uh, in, in the Far East and in, in, in um, Pacific Ocean and everywhere. They have all plenty of fish, but because they don't have a very a very uh, efficient roads, uh, rail, railroads, they don't have speed trains, mm -hmm. they don't have factories there, they don't have freezers there, that goes to West. And Russia is paying huge amount of money to Norway and to other countries buying the fish from somewhere else. So if they had only... Uh, exactly. Exactly. Uh, In Africa, the same thing. Yeah. If yeah. they only had the infrastructure, yeah. then all that food would be, would be enough to feed the Africans and export. That's but they right. can't because... It, yeah, of the yeah. And then there, there's no reason to grow it if you, if you can't get it out, you know. That's right. What's the fourth principle? Uh, the f well, there's four reports. The fourth principle is, in, in the four laws is, is fusion power in the space program. The drivers for the drivers. technology. The drivers for science. the four science. scientific breakthroughs. Yes. The, the, the ability to go... Uh, and revolutionize your entire uh, understanding of, uh, of, of, of of space, of, of atoms, of you know, of matter, of energy. You know, it's 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 that's your driver. That's your that's your driver for the whole thing. Is is, is those breakthroughs that that uh, bring you forward? Yeah. Yeah, about this point here about the technology and uh, this is not really new. No. I mean, it happened after the Industrial Revolution came in, it's the same story. That you get the machines to do jobs that was used to be done by people. Right. Yeah. The problem is not that. The problem is not having machines to do things. The problem is that people who were lost their jobs because of these machines were not trained to do something else. Yeah. Exactly. The, the machines need people to build those machines and program them and all of that. And maintenance of And these people who have been taken off, the right. animal labor should have been trained to get into this new kind of jobs. But they didn't, didn't have. No. In the United States, the coal miners were left alone. Yeah. The steel industry was disseminated and people who work in the exactly. steel industry were left exactly. alone. Yeah. This is a real problem. The, 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 the surplus in human labor that was created by the innovation was not realized 
in further development. And right. that's exactly, exactly the point, the lack of the realization of the surplus. So you're wasting human beings. This is the whole point. You're taking an entire group of people and you're wasting them. They are become a waste. And this is criminal. And uh, this is the whole point. And your, okay. your number two said, this is where productive capital has disappeared. So we're, we're not able to retrain people. Exactly. exactly. So, and that's Hamilton, by the way. Okay, go ahead. Oh, well, I'm just wondering, like, what about the whole agricultural complex? Is there anything here to um, address that or to deal with it? You know, like there's Monsanto and there was like the Green Revolution in the 60s that brought in the pesticides and like does Trump talk about that? Okay, we, we may, you and I may have some differences here. Um, the Green Revolution that occurred in the 60s was very crucial to uh, India, to China, and to, to uh, especially. Um, and it involved uh, developing better seeds and better, better um, 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 uh, productive powers. Now, well, it, there is some issue, there is some issue with the gene, the gene uh, issue, which is one issue, and I'm not resolved on that. The other issue is Monsanto patenting all of this stuff yeah. is criminal, yes. right there. That's, that's criminal. That's absolutely criminal. That's criminal, and it has to be. And, and, and I hope nobody observes those patents anyhow. anyhow. But, well, the so-called the Green Revolution. One thing that they did in India, it was like a big sales pitch for the pesticide, for the, for the pesticide companies. So they sold a lot of these things, and um, it put out of work a lot of the small farmers. Uh, that uh, so it created like large okay. Again, plantations for export, but the, the small farmers within we're, India we're getting we're getting were, were wiped out. We're getting the same the same issue that we raised earlier with throwing all these Mexicans out of work, right? And, yeah, and throwing similar. people off the coal mines and, and the steel mines. It's the same issue. It's the realizing the potential that this creates. But let me let me just give you some idea. I don't know how pe how many people know this, but um, um, if you have agriculture with tractors. Okay? And, and other inputs. And then you have ag agriculture with animal, meaning uh, draft animals, you know, to break the land. Right. And then you have uh, just humans. Yeah, hand driven tools. Yeah. Hand, hand tools. Does anybody have any idea what the difference in production is? Exponential. It's exponential. There you go. It's exponential. Mm -hmm. This is exponential over this, and this is exponential over that. Now, about 10 years ago, I saw a study where it said that 1 billion farmers, 1 billion farmers are still at this level of well, hand tools. Hand tools. Yeah. And then this was another billion. And this was something like um, um, hundred million. Maybe. It was something something no. much smaller. It's like two or three million. Like under a million. Okay. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's I would million. say that um, there's quality and there's quantity. Yes, I, I I get that. Now what I'm saying to you is that is that uh, this is something like two hundred thousand. 200 million. It's really no, no, I don't know. It's, it's something like 38 million at the time. 38 million farmers. Something, uh, you, you know, 38 million. Okay. Now, the point is, if you have seven, if you have seven uh, plus billion or seven and a half billion people on the planet, okay, and you need to feed them with a decent amount of food. You're not going to do it by keeping agriculture in, in, this, in this realm. Now, beyond tractor farming, 
we go into aeroponics in the future. Yeah, that's what's coming. Which is uh, quantity and quality. <laughs> because you scientifically will determine the precise input, computerized input, in water in the air to be absorbed by the plant that will give you the highest nutrition and the highest quality and quantity. The highest value, too. The highest value. Yeah. But that's the future. Yeah, but already, um, okay, I have an investigated hydroponics. No, not hydro, aeroponics. Oh, aeroponics. Aeropon hydroponics is very similar to regular agriculture in that you have, yeah, you have yeah. artificial... Yeah. Uh, but aeroponics is you grow things in the air. Okay, I have not invested. Okay, enough. what it is, is, is I just the point is the solution is not to shut down the productive yeah. development of this because you might think that it's causing uh, less quality food or maybe it's, it, there's, a, there's a huge movement out there just to tell you that um, um, organic farming is the best farming and I worked on an organic farm and I can tell you it was pretty good quality food. Uh, I ate it. It was good. I liked it. Um, but, 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 but my my farmer friend had to keep the. He had a. He was restricted in how much he could produce, and uh, so you know. So, so the future. I look to the future. I, I'm not trying to shut this. I don't want to shut down modern agriculture, even though there are a lot of issues with it, and uh, you know. But but there's there's no like there's um there's plenty of food there's like excess food apparently they dump the food into the ocean right but we're talking we're talking <laughs> about not just the amount of food but we're talking about the infrastructure that can deliver that can uh, deliver it and yeah we, we may not agree on everything on this yeah, okay. I, just, I just wanted to say something okay. go ahead if you think about this. This is really directly related to the energy dynasty. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the energy question. Yeah. It is, yeah. It is the energy dynasty in particular because if you look at the amount of energy consumed in a tractor based farm, is it's right. it's to the, the person to the. It is, is, is exponential. It's exponential. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. I just wanted to say something uh, uh, in regards to what sorry, <clears throat> Helen, Helen is saying. I, I used to live in Africa. And believe me, uh, children are starving there. There is plenty of land, but people who are uh, even uh, doing by uh, a hand, um, uh, by uh, de uh, developing that by hand, they are, they would sell that their uh, products so yeah. to get to get food, uh, to get uh, books, to get clothes and whatnot. Yeah. And children are starving. So uh, yes, here in the West, we uh, West of all, we have plenty of food, but two thirds of the world are starving, and you cannot do it by hand. It's not possible. So, uh, as much as I like or organic myself, <laughs> and I think it's good. But if you think about the humanity, uh, about uh, uh, the planet, uh, you need something. No, anyways. Okay. There's so much more to it. <laughs> okay. Lois, what were you going to say? Oh. I was just Talk gonna say. Louder. I was gonna say going back to the idea of robotics and and obsolescence. Go ahead. What? Robotics, obsolescence in jobs. So I was thinking about these automatic vehicles that are, you know, the driverless vehicles that they're uh, um, developing right now. That there is something like 50% of the U.S. population makes their living from driving, whether it's it's all different kinds of truck drivers from international harvesters down to local delivery, to delivery couriers, to um, taxi drivers yeah, right. to and, uh, uh, and and there's an great incredible anxiety amongst those people in terms of what what are they going to do and hope, hopefully this will pick up and they'll have other options but there's big anxiety and I didn't know that the numbers were so high on that up to fifty percent yeah this is this is this is the whole purpose of why you need to have a society that 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 is constantly developing. Depopulation. Huh? Depopulation. No, yeah, but constantly developing new areas because people have to, people cannot stay 
in one area. And people, um, you have a whole underclass in the United States that is uh, not able for many reasons to connect in with, and I don't know about Canada, connect in with uh, the computer and, and all of that. And then you have a large portion of the population is mentally, uh, mentally disturbed by whatever, the drugs, the media, the culture, whatever. You have an increasingly large portion of the population is, op is mentally disturbed. One in four autistic children. Yeah. You just, it's just massive what's, what's going mm -hmm. on. And the, the society, uh, probably the biggest impact on mental health is the drug epidemic and its consequences. And also the, the pedophilia stuff is also very, has, has a huge impact on the mental health of people uh, and the culture, the TV, whatever. So you're dealing with uh, uh, a real uh, problem which you, if you're committed to development, you're going to have to deal with. You're going to have to deal with this. You're going to have to put people in, in, in productive employment. You're going to have to develop them. And I, uh, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to destroy a human being, have them do nothing. Yep. Have them do nothing. Have them, have them do nothing. Just, and that's, yeah, okay. Hopelessness is a huh? fact. Hopelessness is a factor yeah. that uh, All destroys of that. society. Yeah. So, so the question is, uh, is it, is, okay, now let me get to the, get, get to the big issue here. We have a new paradigm emerging in the world. And whole parts of the world are becoming optimistic. Places in Africa are like seeing this rail line that's being developed between Djibouti and, and, and Ethiopia. They are becoming, they're starting to have hope. China, the, pop, the Chinese dream. India, the same thing, starting to happen. Entire populations are starting to have a different orientation. The question is, when will that come here? When will we have people beginning to have a sense of a future, a hope, a, 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 a sense that you can raise your family, you can, you can, you can, you have something other than living in 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 in, in conditions where you you don't know whether you have a nuclear war, or you know whether you're going to have, a, you know, whatever. You know, terrorized. The population is completely terrorized. Uh, the, the question is how are you going to, the question is when is this new spirit going to come here? It's now beginning to take off in all around the world. And the question is when is this new spirit going to come here? Isn't that the part of the force that got uh, Trump elected? Uh, yes. That, that's, that's part of it. And now the oligarchy goes after Trump. Uh, and uh, they're, they're smearing him in the press. And uh, just about a week ago, a fellow from Mexico called me and said, uh, we talked about this thing. And he said, you know, I heard reports that uh, newspapers that are slandering Trump are losing leadership. Their, their leadership is going down. Uh, can you, uh, did you notice something on the streets on that effect? Well, I'm going to be very honest. Um, I, I, I could get in trouble for saying what I'm going to say. We won't tell. This is the same piece. This is the same piece. Well, you're a camera. During the period from 2010 to about 2000, well, to 2014, my I was out on the street in post offices and in in front of post offices in not in the inner cities, not in the downtown areas, but in the suburbs and <coughs> small towns all over Oregon, Washington, Idaho, especially all over Oregon and Washington. And we had a sign that was very popular. It was impeach Obama with a Hitler mustache. And the population was coming up. 
in droves. They were contributing, they were giving us their names and everything. But on what basis were they doing this? A lot of them did it because they were racist. <laughs> and they thought the United States shouldn't have a nigger in the White House. <laughs> A lot of them did it because they thought he was a Muslim. <laughs> we shouldn't have a Muslim as president. <laughs> a lot of them did it because some of them did it for the right reason. But a lot of them, they didn't know where China was. They didn't know where Russia was. I mean, they didn't know what they thought China was the enemy and they thought Russia was the enemy. And, um, and everyone would say the same thing. They would say the same thing. Those illegal immigrants are getting on welfare, and I'm paying for it. That was the, the most common thing I would say. And then I would try to discuss Glass-Steagall with them, and that wasn't working. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't working. No. And I heard this time and time and time again. And we're talking about people who literally could be in a fascist mob. Now, okay, now, then I would go, then Obama did something about, doing something about guns. <laughs> and I went to the gun, uh, the, no, the gun, uh, gun shows. Yeah. Right. And these people were very serious. They were ready. And I would have discussions with them. And they were ready for the revolution, to, to protect their family and their little group of people and their home and what have you, they did not have much hope from what they could see in the society. Okay, now this is scary, but I talked to these people, I talked to thousands of these people over the course of this period of time, and I got them literature and we discussed the, the strategies. Some of them were very intelligent and were very aware, but they did not believe that it was possible to save this country of the United States. Excuse me, I'm in Canada. <laughs> it wouldn't be possible to save the United States. It was not a possibility. It was only a matter of when. When this thing would go. And I'm talking thousands of people like this. So these are the people that voted for Trump. Okay. And they could have been a Hitler's, I'm saying this, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting into a trouble here. They could have been voting for Adolf Hitler, and, you know, that's how, that's, that's, and so, yeah, they could have been voting for Adolf Hitler, and they would have supported Adolf Hitler in this situation. Okay. Make America great again. Why not? You know, the chinks. They gotta go, the niggers, they're, you know, all the crime, the Mexicans, all the Mexicans are doing all this. They could have done that. However, there's the Mexicans are too there are too many of them in the United States, so they're not gonna be able to do much about that. And uh, there's too much intermarriage going on between uh, Mexicans and non-Mexicans. So it's not it's not a it's not it's not a really a really a goal. Go, go, on that one. So, and, and the integration in the South and the United States between the black and the, and the, and, and the other population has changed. It's dramatically changed. It, it, there is a tremendous uh, integration that's happened in, in the southern part of the United States. So, so that's another issue. So, so however, this is the population. And, and, you, and I'm telling you, the people who created this whole thing no doubt had in mind in Europe and in the United States, the option of having an America first war on the world mentality. And similar in Europe. And they play it, they play this off against, you know, they play them off against the, the educated urban people who look at these people and are horrified. They're horrified. They don't even want to go near them. They, and I spent years talking to these people, and they're decent people. They're moral. They're just, they don't, 
it's just it's just very strange, you know. And you talk to them, and you get to know them, and you, you have these arguments, you have these discussions, and you try to get them to understand the bigger picture. And it's it's difficult. It's very difficult. But I spent much of my life doing that. 